I'm Ken Schaefer. You're watching METCOM. On today's program, we're going to cover a piece of Canadian history that isn't very well known. It's called script. Our guests today are Calvin Reset and Leah Dorian, both of the Gabriel DeMont Institute. And this is what they had to say about script. down to its origins and its simplest terms and all that stuff, it comes from the word description. And it's a segment out of a word, and it's spelled S-C-R-I-P. There's no T on the end. And what it means is it's a description of a corporation has an asset, has the value to honor a document. To put it into a contemporary reality, a check is a form of script. If I give you a check, make out a check to you for $500, what I'm saying to you is, I have $500 in the bank, and the bank will honor that. So this document is a form of script saying, I have the assets to make that document valuable. And if you look at the contemporary society, we look at it, we say, okay, those are used all the time. We go into the store, the grocery store, the coupons. Those little things worth $2 off in your next box of soap, $2 off in your next cheeseburger. Those are technically a form of script. Why was script given? Where it came from, like that's what it, how it's used today, and where it came from was during the settling of the Canadian West, Canadian Northwest, as part of John A. Macdonald, who was the Prime Minister of Canada in 1867, one of the principles of his government and policies and philosophies was the creation of something called the National Policy. And the National Policy was uh, peopling Western Canada with European immigrants. Um, if you look at Canadian history at sort of the, the earliest times, Canada was a colony of Europe. Cal Canada was a place where wealth was generated, sent back to England, sent back to France, just like other countries had South America. The wealth from there was going back to Spain and Portugal. South Africa, the wealth from there was going back to Holland. And it was a colonial power where the wealth was generated in one country, went back to another country. The same principle came under the national policy where Western Canada was to generate the wealth to make the East wealthy. And to do that, you looked at the West and who was the people here? There were Indian people and there were some mixed blood people here as a result of the fur trade. There were very few non-Aboriginal people. And uh, so as a result of this, in order to generate revenue, the fur economy was dying or dead, nearly, and then the wheat economy was going to replace it, replace it. And so the farmers that were to be the generators of this wealth were needed to be imported. I first heard about script uh, when I took a Métis history class at the University of Saskatchewan oh, quite a few years ago. and. Through that, um, her learning about script, I found out that in my own family that we did receive script certificates. And I thought, what is this? You know, I didn't know that we were a part of this process. And in our family, there was very little left in the oral living tradition about what was script and what it meant. In our family history, we had one of our, my dad's grandfathers said, well, there was a man in our, who did come up to Cumberland House and bought script. And he said, but the community never knew anything about what script was. They heard nothing about it after that process. So after hearing that, I wanted to know more about the process. And so when I had the opportunity, and I think it was 1993, to do a, a study on the script system in Canada, um, I took the opportunity up and I studied with Frank Tuff, uh, the head of Native Studies Department, and we did a project on Métis script system in Canada. And we looked at the process of script, 
what Scrip was, and how it failed to provide the Métis with a land base. So that's really what got me involved in Scrip. Um, having that close family connection to what Scrip was, kind of ins it made it a personal passion for me to know more. So that's what really got me started. What is the significance of Scrip to or Scrip to Canadian history? A lot of people hear the word Scrip and they're probably going, what is it? I have never heard of this in my entire life. And rightfully so, Scrip is a part of our past. It's a part of our history. What Scrip is, it was a system to deal with land grants. And it was modeled from the United States. Um, they used it to issue land grants to white settlers and people living out in the, out in the um, extended colonies. So the USA used Scrip system to allocate land. So the Canadian government decided as they expanded into Western Canada to use the Scrip system to extinguish and deal with Métis land rights. So Scrip is basically, I can compare it to a coupon, where a person takes the coupon in and then gets something in return. And Scrip is just that kind of system. It basically is a land Scrip or money Scrip, where the person will take it in to get money or land. To bring these immigrant farmers in, the Canadian government needed control of large tracts of land that they could attract these farmers. Here, I'll give you a homestead, I'll give you farmland, I'll give you the opportunity to start over. And if you look at many of the small communities in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, there's Mennonite communities, there's French communities, there's Ukrainian communities. Large segments of European populations came here with the promise of starting over a new life, wonderful things that, was they, for the most part, they were oppressed in their own land. So as they came here, the government needed to make large tracts of land available to them, made it attractive. So they went about signing treaties with First Nations people, or Indian people, as they called them at that point. And every time they signed a treaty with Indian people, it created a reserve land base for the Indian people. And every time they issued treaty to Indian people, they issued script to many people. And the first example of uh, a huge example of script land was um, the Manitoba Act. When Manitoba was created as a province, 1.4 million acres of land was set aside for Métis people and their families because Manitoba had a very large Métis population. And instead of... Is this looked upon by the federal government in history then as being an inherent right? that maybe people have a right to this land, according to the Manitoba Act, or... Well... I must have touched on something here. I don't know. Inherent right. That's, that's an interesting... Inherent right. An inherent right is something that is yours because you are you. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it in terms of treaty land entitlements and claims and land claims and all that, it would be classified as a comprehensive land claim. And a comprehensive land claim is something like they have specific land claims and comprehensive claims and a specific claim is something that is a direct result of a shortfall as a result of a treaty or an agreement and this 1.4 million acres you could probably say that was a specific land claim he's saying okay we are entitled to large tracts of land because of the nature of being here and this was our land and we were displaced that's sort of the the nature and the views of comprehensive claims so because of you've been there forever that it's your land by because of first usage and all that, yeah, it's an inherent right. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a human right, it's a basic right. This is our land, we've been here for a long time. And so we have the right to that land, and we have the right to use it, and therefore we have a degree of ownership in some way, shape, or form. And Scrip became a device that the government used to get the title from Métis people. Is the treaty process that they use to establish treaties and the script process different? Treaties ensured 
an ongoing relationship between the federal government and the First Nations people. And that relationship was an ongoing responsibility between the First Nations people and the federal government. There were treaty annuities, there were reserve lands set aside, and Indian Affairs created to, to administer program services to, to First Nations people. And that's the difference. Whereas the script process, there was no federal relationship. It was a one-time grant. There was no um, um, benefits, long-term benefits, and no reserve lands surveyed to give a continued um, land base and area, um, distinctive political, social area to develop the Métis culture and identity and build communities. So I think that um, the treaty-making process in many ways, you know, still kept that collective identity for First Nations people. It made it easier to maintain their distinctiveness, their languages, and their culture, whereas Métis were very subject to assimilation through the script system model. I feel assimilation was the foundation for that model in many ways. When the government gave the script, did they give the script in the mainstream of North America? Or was it designated, just like, for instance, treaty land, to be only given in certain areas? Or was it open, like we could get the best farmland or, you know, off the script, or was it selected? Well, the best sort of example, if you uh, think of the Manitoba Act, because I mentioned earlier, 1.4 million acres of land. And I looked at sort of a map of the land that was designated and none of that land had any access to water. And if you look at Métis people in the historical past, every Métis family lived on a river line type of land where they had a small piece of river frontage, a very thin sort of farmland that went, went back for several miles, three or four miles or well, five kilometers in the back where they had hay and they had wood and they had all, everything they needed had river frontage for canoes and access to water for their gardens and all sorts of things. And the new scripts, uh, or the new, the government survey system based on one mile square has really sort of tore that system apart, really threw the many people into a real disjointed area. You have to look at many of the other principles and the things that happened around many people for that, that point in history were French speakers. Not well educated. Uh, the documents policies, very legalistic jargon, written in English, tacked up in town on a town bulletin board, and sort of saying, script will be allocated on Friday next in the township 14, range 12, west of the 14th meridian. Now, how relevant is that to the ordinary person? Well, obviously, they wouldn't have of course any not. clue where no. that parcel of land was. Not. And so they were not there for their script. And so as a result of that, um, they would not get the, the land that they wanted, or their own land, or um, land that was good. And uh, so it became, I think the intentions at the first were honorable by the government. You know, the intent was there, was sort of was a very good comprehensive way of giving many people a fair deal, giving them an allocation to their land, etc. But as it turned out, and in, in oftentimes, other people, other players get involved. In this case, a lot of bankers got involved, a lot of storekeepers, a lot of uh, land speculators, people who are in there and interested in making money. And a lot of people, a lot of plans were set up. Uh, like Scrip was issued mostly for a dollar sixty, for a hundred and sixty dollars. That was sort of the plan or 160 acres, because land was valued at $1 per acre. Métis script is a Western phenomena. For Métis people living in Eastern Canada, there was no actual script system in place to deal with their land rights. The script system was started in Manitoba at the Red River Settlement, where there was a huge Métis population. And in 1870, Louis Riel organized the Métis of the Red River Settlement to discuss and lobby Canada about la Métis land rights and lobby Canada for lands. And so in 1870, after a major resistance and um, vocal um, concerns 
passed on to Canada by the Métis people, um, Métis people were granted scrip after 1870 in the Manitoba Act. So Manitoba is where it was first issued, and that was in 1870. Shortly after that, as Canada expanded west, the railway started to expand westward, and there was plans for settling the west and bringing in farmers. The Canadian government realized that they had to create a system to extinguish and to basically provide Métis people with lands by law. And what um, the Scrip system basically did is it was extended to the Northwest Territories, to all Métis people living outside Manitoba. So places like, um, you know, uh, well, it was called Rupert's Land. We would have had Saskatchewan, northern Alberta, parts of the uh, Northwest Territories today, like the Mackenzie River system, and parts of southern Alberta. So that was sort of the areas where Scrip was extended to. Scrip was never issued to Métis people living in B.C., and it wasn't issued to people living, Métis people in the Yukon. So there's still today a very limited area where Scrip has been issued in Western Canada. It's really a, a Western Canadian phenomena. And so for every family of five, if you look at the treaty allotments, for every family of five, 160 acres were designated. And then in some treaties, it was for every family of five, one square mile was designated. And so Métis land, things were the same, 160 acres of land for every five people, family of five. That was sort of a, the original allotment. And instead of saying, OK, uh, I'll give you 160 acres of land. Now, I'm going to be a little bit dishonest here, OK? And I'm going to say, OK, I want to give you 160 acres of land. But uh, Ken, instead of giving you the land you currently live on or good land close by, I'm going to tell you that you can't have that land because somebody else has got it or it's not within the agreement or whatever. I'm going to tell you your land is not in Saskatchewan at all. Your land is in northern Alberta, up around north of Edmonton. Now, do you want to go up there? Because if you do, I can give you a beautiful piece of land, 160 acres of land. But if you don't want to go there, I'll give you a document that says it's worth $160 instead of 160 acres. And you can walk into anywhere with that $160, and it's cash on demand. And you're going to say, hey, I'm going to take that $160, because then I can go buy the land for a dollar an acre, right, the land I want, if I, if I so choose. So that becomes another way of things transferring around. So there was a lot of options. A lot of options. But then... Uh, as I give you that document, you have this little document that says it's worth $160. Now, you come into the land office, and it's another guy that I know that's working in the land office, and he's saying, oh, yeah, 160 acres of land, $160. Well, this stuff is not worth $160. It's Canadian tire money. All right, sort of principle here? The negotiation. Yeah, and sort of say, okay, it's now, I'll give you $80 cash money. Right here, right now, 80 bucks cash in hand for that document. What are your options? You have very little food. You have no support. For most part, it's something that you don't understand anyway. And cash in hand. Many people were practical people. $80 in your hand, in your pocket, is worth a heck of a lot more than an, a, a, an idealistic piece of land somewhere in northern Alberta, you know? So you really didn't know where it was located. Right, right. So. A lot of people took that $80 as a means of feeding their families. And storekeepers saying, hey, bring your script in. I'll run you a charge account. And that charge account, I'll let it run up 80 bucks. Give me your document. Your credit limit's over. And so they got the land, for the most part, at half the value of what the script said. And so it was short-valued. It was a deliberate collaboration between many lawyers, land speculators, bankers, people involved in scamming the land back. And for the most part, most of it did go back. Uh, you know, people, historians, people, politicians that are involved in it, they say as much as 99% have gone back to government through lawyers and agencies. And sort of the lawyer would sell it, make money on it, or a land agent, and the government would pay market value for it back. Eh? So for the most part, probably the government isn't... Uh, the one doing the unscrupulous dealings, it's the 
the people. And in fact, many enough people involved in this were the federal cabinet ministers and stuff like that because conflict of interest was a way of life back then. It was legal. In fact, it was frowned on if you weren't in, on the take. The question I, I ask today is, there was to be all this land allotted by law. The Manitoba Act said 1.4 million acres. But in reality today, when we, we look at the Métis people today, how many have actually settled on the script lands that were intended for their families and their people? And when we look at that and we study that today, we realize that in essence, the script system failed the Métis people. It did not provide that adequate land base that was intended. What I see happening, Métis people are being included into the negotiation process. They're being shut out, they're being ignored. The government is dictating the terms. And what will end up happening, I suppose, is uh, Métis people are part of the infrastructure of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta. They're not a large population, but they're a part of the population, a significant part. Certainly, from the way I see it, like they're 10 or 15 percent of the population. Then, okay, for that population, they have the potential to, if it's negotiated, if it's done in a fair, uh, open-minded manner, things can work very well with the government, and probably not be an expensive process. And if you end up going through a legalistic court case and lots of fighting, who gets rich? The lawyers. And uh, certainly the government doesn't benefit from it. The people don't benefit, creates a lot of hard feelings. We know, study history, governments are there to be elected from term to term. And they don't have large, long philosophical goals when it comes to election day. Well, who currently would own then or hold most of the script land that was issued? Uh, Back in Canadian history, who has it? And, uh, the farmers of Saskatchewan. Métis people may not have fully been informed about their rights. There were definite linguistic barriers. And for our family, uh, in the Dorian family, when I looked at the script, you know, there were many who only spoke Cree. And these people did not have the understanding of property, of surveys. This was beyond their worldview in, in many of the communities, Ilo La Crosse, Cumberland House, they are still dealing in Hudson Bay Company tokens. A script coupon, a paper, to them was meaningless. And I feel that uh, because of that, they were completely outside the script process. It, it just really wasn't a reality for them. And as a result, I feel many people did not realize that this was to extinguish their, their rights to the land. Leah, could you explain to me what an actual land or script speculator was and who were some of the people that actually benefited, profited by, you know, obtaining script? Well, there's been so much research done on script speculation now. It's, it's, it's a reality in the script system. And if you study it, you have to look at the great deal of speculation. Now, why would speculators want script is a, is a question. Speculators saw script as an opportunity to um, capitalize on the land that was opening up for settlement. Script was very attractive. They could buy up Métis script very cheap from Métis people who, who didn't have an understanding of, of money and concept of wealth um, according to Euro-Canadian standards. And they could buy it for simple trade items or a few dollars when it was valued at $1,000 or so at the time. So they saw that there were some advantages in their dealings because of the, the, um, the, well, the, the uneducated perspective of many of the Métis people at the time. They didn't have the same educational background. So speculators saw that as an opportunity to actively buy scripts, pool them, um, in banks and major institutions and, and benefit from the wealth generated from money script, for instance. Or they could also patent the land, Métis land scripts, in their own names, hold them for 10 or so years when settlement um, increased in the West and they brought settlement uh, in through the railway, then the, the, the price of land skyrocketed and the Métis script land they bought for next to nothing, the price of it was double or triple and they were making a huge amount of profit at something that they put very little capital in as an investment. So they certainly um, benefited. There was obvious benefits to being organized and in dealing with Métis script and, and speculation. Um, some of the major speculators that um, 
the association of Métis and non-status Indians developed, uh, they, they did some research in the late 80s. And some of the major speculators that they noted in Métis script, this is land and money, was the Imperial Bank of Canada, the Merchants Bank of Canada, Bank of Hamilton, Bank of Montreal, Dominion Bank, Bank of Ottawa, Molson's Bank, and Alloway and Champion Bank. We're talking major institutions taking part in the Métis script system. They saw the obvious benefits of this system. And so um, with the research that's, that's um, been done, we can see that speculation was certainly known by government. We, we know that now. And we can see that they often didn't challenge that speculation. They saw the speculation as something that is assisting the settlement of the West. But of course, it didn't benefit the Métis. And they were the ones who basically did not benefit from the system. Many people are all individualistic and entrepreneurial. And it's, I would be very wrong to say that many people were fools and in the dark, or all of them. Many of them were very involved in these scams themselves. Like there were many people that were, in fact, on the take and were doing it to their own. And they were buying the land, uh, doing it to their cousins, their relatives, their friends, people who trusted them. Hey, it still goes on. And uh, they, in fact, were profiting as a result of it, and then they would sell it to somebody else, or they kept it. There were a lot of examples in, of many people who have family and wealth as a result of looking after their own people. That's sort of where it's at. And yeah, script has a sour taste. <laughs> you know, if you're looking at it in history, Skip has a sour, script has a real sour taste for a lot of people. That's got a sweet taste for a few people. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you found it both educational as well as informative. And I'd like to thank our guests that have appeared on today's program. I'm Ken Schaefer. Please do join us again right here at Metcom.